Hi everyone, I am back with another Conversations with Katie, as promised, uh, where I sit down and answer all of your questions. These will be anonymous, so I will not be reading your names, so you don't have to worry about that. So let's get started. The first question is, is it easier in ballet to be a shorter or taller dancer? Which do you prefer and what is the ideal height for a ballerina? That's a very good question, but I can tell you that there is no set height for a dancer. I am five foot four and a bit, and uh, I'm actually on the shorter side, but it's not like the Rockettes where you have to be at least 5'7". Um, this is, it's very broad. Maria Kachakova, a beautiful dancer from San Francisco Ballet, principal, big star, is five feet tall. Whereas someone like Maria Kurowski from the New York City Ballet, who is long and lanky, you know, just gorgeous limbs and everything, she's around 5'10", I would say, maybe a little taller. Um, so there's really a very, very broad range. Um, there's no set height. And depending on your height, you will be paired with a partner that can partner you. Um, so even for the bigger roles, Juliet, Giselle, uh, Sugar Plum Fairy, in any company, it's not really, it's not a problem. You just get paired with someone that can partner you. Um, so don't worry about your height. Who were your inspirations growing up as a student? And now, who do you look up to and find inspiration from as a professional dancer? My favorite ballerina growing up um, and still might be, is Jennifer Ringer um, from the New York City Ballet, even though she retired. She is so beautiful and so kind. She's been a dear friend to me for, for a very long time um, and has been so gracious in, in all of her, her givingness and her generosity. Um, but even as a, as a young student before I knew her, um, she's just so breathtakingly beautiful as a dancer. But I also loved Wendy Whalen and Darcy Kistler from the New York City Ballet. Um, my favorite European dancers, Darcy Bustle, uh, English Darcy Bustle, beautiful from the Royal Ballet. Um, and now I love Marianella Nunez and Alina Kojikaru. Um, and Yevgenia Ovzabetrova, I believe I said that right, from Bolshoi. So they're just, I have a lot that I love. But my favorites tend to be the artistic dancers who really can make something out of just even standing on the stage rather than, you know, they do 15 pirouettes. So I really love, I love those kind of dancers. Of course, most of them can still do 15 pirouettes. Marinella Nunez can just, you know, whip out the triple fuertes. But I really enjoy people who are artists. Were you born with a natu naturally high arches or hyperextension? If not, did you stretch and make it happen? And do you think you can make it professionally with a big company if you don't have hyperextension and high arches? First of all, as far as hyperextension goes, it makes no difference whatsoever. I was born with hyperextension. I have very hyperextended legs. Um, people would try and get me to pull back from it, actually. But it, while it makes your lines prettier, so they say, it's not... Companies are not going to say, oh, well, she, has, she doesn't have hyperextended legs, I'm not going to hire her. It makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. What it will make a difference with is your dancing. If you are a very weak dancer because of it, they won't take you. Um, it's basically just being a good, strong dancer, hyperextension or not. Now, as far as the feet go, you have to look like you can point your feet. You don't have to have Alessandra Ferry arches, <coughs> excuse me, but you have to be able to look like you can point your feet. Um, it doesn't, again, doesn't have to be, you know, crazy, but you have to be able to get over your shoes. Simple enough. If you don't look like you have pointed feet, they won't take you. Does it have to be insane? Absolutely not. There are many people, many famous dancers with incredible feet and many that are just simply very strong and have great feet. Not wonderful, but really good. It's more about how it affects your dancing. If you are a strong dancer and or you are an artistic dancer, it really doesn't make a difference. As long as you are a good enough dancer, the feet don't matter so much as long as you look at you can point them. Do you wear makeup to ballet class or rehearsals? What do you re recommend for our sweaty faces to prevent breakouts? Great question. I do wear makeup pretty much every day of my life. I will never leave the house without a little bit on. Um, and as far as ballet goes, and rehearsals, absolutely. I think I've mentioned to you all to you all before that I like Bare Minerals a lot. Mineral all natural makeup um, that really keeps my skin great. Um, I also like tinted moisturizers. I believe I showed you all one at some point from Laura Mercier. Um, so I just like very light products, but I do wear makeup. But I'm more concerned. I'm so obsessive about my skin and keeping it healthy and eating well and drinking a lot of water. 
um, so I don't have to wear a lot of caked makeup on. I can get away with wearing a, a light mineral finish just fine. So I think it kind of stems from keeping good care of yourself, but then wearing some sort of, of makeup. I absolutely do. The Leading Ladies everyday series that I've been showing you all are perfect everyday looks. I've really tried to make those accessible, especially the Juliet one and the Odile one. Um, the Odile one is very, very neutral colors. Pretty much anybody can wear it. So I'd recommend those as everyday looks. I want to be a professional dancer and I have had an opportunity to train and possibly be able to compete at the Youth America Grand Prix competition. I hope to get a scholarship to a school. What do you think about these competitions? Do you have any tips from, for me to perform well? And someone else asked, asked, what do you think of ballet competitions as a way to get noticed and get into good schools? Okay, first of all, I never did ballet competitions. Do I think they're a good idea? Yes. Um, especially if you do not get performance opportunities at your ballet school. I got fantastic performance opportunities at my ballet school, Mobile Ballet. We did three huge productions every year. We always did a Nutcracker, and then it was something like Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, you know, the big ones. So I performed a lot. Um, so I didn't really feel the need to compete. Also with New York City Ballet, most people don't run the competition circuit. I believe a few did, but it's not usually the normal thing to do. It's much more of the ABT route or the um, sort of European route, but so it was never really on my radar. Um, however, do I think they're a good idea? Yes, again, for the performance experience because you need that. The problem comes into play when people get so caught up in competing that, I mean, I've known people who literally would do a bar and then run their variation and just work on their variation every day. That's where it becomes a problem because you cannot just do one variation for a year. You will miss out on all of your ballet training. You need to be in full classes every single day, five to six days a week. Um, and especially if you do just a variation every day all day long, you're going to be very lopsided. You're going to be only turning one way, only releving on one leg, only doing arabesque to one side. So I think they're a good idea for the performance experience and for how to be under pressure. But if you forget about everything else, you forget about full classes, you don't work on other variations, you don't work on normal ballet things that ballet students in ballet schools are doing, it could be a huge, huge problem. So if you do do competitions, make sure you're still getting the full sort of student experience, full class, other variations, because that can also add to your performance experience and you'll end up doing better in the competition. How do you deal with not getting auditions? This can be kind of tricky um, because many of the times people think that when they don't get an audition it's simply because they're not a good dancer, which is not the case at all. Sometimes it has to do with the fact that the school just doesn't have any spots or if it's a company audition they might be looking for taller dancers and you're short or vice versa or they need a specific kind of dancer, um, but if it's a school audition most of the time if they don't take you, it's because you're lacking in something. It's not because you're a bad dancer. You might not have, the, the turns might not be there yet, or you're, you need to work on your jumps, or they just need you to, to improve for another year and then come back. There are plenty, and I'm not going to name names, but there are big stars right now who did not get into their the summer courses the first time. They got rejection letters. They didn't, they just didn't get in places plenty of them and names you would know. So just because you don't get into a summer course doesn't really mean anything. As long as you keep working, you keep trying, you find a summer course or a school that can help you improve, um, that's really all that matters. Uh, because there are plenty of big stars out there who did not get into summer courses their first go around. And I think you all would be surprised. Now as far as company auditions go, don't get frustrated. Again, they might not have spots, especially company auditions, they might not have spots. They have, most companies are businesses. They're all businesses. So they have a certain number of, of contracts they can have. They might not be able to pay you. Um, so again, don't take it so personally. Um, so just keep working. What do company directors value more, technique or artistry? Would companies, would small companies at least, take someone who has the artistry for ballet but doesn't have very good extensions, for example? All right, I want to say one thing before I get into this. People get so caught up in your extensions and how high your leg goes. It does not make one difference. Yes, girls have to have it a little above 90, 
but it does not have to be, you know, wrapped around your head. It doesn't. People get so caught up in, I don't have good extensions and my leg doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. What matters is how, if you have strong technique, if you are a good enough dancer, if you have some artistry, they, you know, and you, you can get your leg up relatively high. It does not have to be up on next to your ear. Now, as far as technique and artistry goes, I would say that they're looking more for solid dancers because artistry you can develop. Technique you can also develop in the company. I, I know my technique got better once I joined New York City Ballet, but but the artistry, people are going to, you're going to get better artistically. Um, they say that you don't reach your peak as a dancer until you're 30. So I've got a ways to go and you know, so you're, it, it's artistry is something you're constantly going to evolve. If you don't have good enough technique, they're not going to take you. So I would say technique is more important. However, now I'm going to contradict myself because as a young student, I was known and I still am for my artistry. I have very solid technique. I wouldn't have, have gotten into the New York City Ballet if I didn't, but I'm not the person that can do 15 pirouettes. I'm not the person that can, I don't have the, you know, Natalie Osipova jump, so, who can literally hit the ceiling. So it's, for me, I had very solid technique. I was clean, I was strong, but for me, it was my artistry. Um, and that's sort of the roles I got in the company as well were very artistic. So it's kind of, it's hard to say. I think it depends on, on the dancer. Um, as far as what they're looking for, as well as the company. Um, but I would say that technique is more important when you're auditioning for a company, simply because, again, the artistry can grow, and if you can't do the ballets and look good doing them, they're not going to take you, regardless of how artistic you are. So I would say technique is a little, slightly more important. What is your opinion on serious ballet dancers having a boyfriend that doesn't dance? Kind of going along with someone else's question that says, what do you do about non-dance friends who don't understand why you're always busy and can't, can't hang out with them? That's a very, very good question because a lot of people have this problem. Um, as far as the friends go first, I had a huge, huge problem with friends when I was younger. I went to a preparatory school that was all about football and people didn't quite understand, what do you mean you're missing the game to go to ballet? What do you mean you're missing a sleepover to go to ballet? They really didn't get it. Um, so what I had to do was decide, do I, rather, do I want to be social and have all the friends and fit in or do I want to go after my dream? And I ended up choosing, you know what, I, I am not going to give this up just to go to the football game. I really, really wanted to be a dancer. Because when you are a professional, I hate to tell you, you really don't have that much of a social life other than with your colleagues. It is all consuming and so you have to decide how much you love it. Um, if you are not willing to commit to it 150%, it might not be the career for you because it is so, so difficult. Thankfully, there are other people there for you to be friends with. Um, at City Ballet, you know, while there were problems between people, at the end of the day, we were all family. We all supported each other. But if you're more concerned with having friends, this might not be the career for you. Um, and that kind of goes along with, well, it's not really goes along with the boyfriend, but as far as the boyfriend goes, if you're someone you're dating, if they do not have to be a dancer, it doesn't matter if they're a dancer, they could be a lawyer, they could be, it doesn't matter. There are plenty of dancers that date non-dancers. The problem lies if they're not supportive of you. If they do not understand and they constantly are, be, you know, belittling you or they're not supportive of your dreams, I think you deserve better. I think you deserve someone that supports you no matter what you do. Um, ballet or not. Now, again, do they have to be a dancer? No, there are plenty of people. I, I know a lot of people who are married to non-dancers who they are so supportive of their wives or their husbands. Um, and it's, it's so nice to see. But if you're with somebody who does not support you, no matter if you're a dancer or not, you deserve better. So I would maybe rethink that. Kind of going along with the friends too. If you have friends that are like, what are you doing? And why are you doing that? And, you know, maybe it's time for some new friends. Um, as far as my situation, I have a couple of really, really good friends. I know I've mentioned Riley before. You will all meet her eventually. She has been my best friend my entire life. We are six years apart. I'm six years older. So I've, I knew her mother when she was pregnant with her. So we go back quite a ways. But, you know, and we did the big sister, little sister time. And now we're at the point where we are friends. And she is so supportive of what I do. She does dance. She dances with the company here in Mobile. 
Um, is she going to be a professional? Does she want to be a professional? No, but she loves it and she's beautiful at it and she has her own interests. But she's so supportive of me, even through this whole thyroid mess. She's one of the people that still believes in me. And uh, I love her to death for it. And do we have to be both be professional dancers and one that... No. But she's so wonderful and supportive of me. And I have my, my doctor... The other friend I have is my doctor's daughter. Her name is Olivia. And she also dances, doesn't want to be a professional, but she supports me. She understands what I do. So that's really it. I have my two friends, and I'm thrilled with them. I don't need 15,000 friends. So, but they both support me. And so that's what I encourage you all to do. If you have a couple of friends that support you, you're golden. Um, but as the boyfriend goes, if he doesn't support you, bye-bye. So you needed somebody that supports you. What is the hardest thing about being a professional dancer? And this kind of goes along with how do you deal with having off days, if you're bad turning days, etc. I think the hardest thing about being a professional is that it all depends on you. Um, I think I've said this before to all of you, is that it is your responsibility to be in shape, to get yourself to class, to keep up your technique, to be in the costume, be in the wing, ready to go, um, which kind of sounds not that hard, but it is entirely on your shoulders. When you're in a ballet school, they guide you, they support you, um, especially when I was at SAB transitioning into the company. The day I got in the company, it was like, okay, that's it, you're on your own. Um, so I would say that's probably the most difficult bit, is that it's entirely up to you. Um, and if you're not ready and you're not responsible and you're not, you know, 100% in shape, you can fall so far from grace so fast. So I would say that it's about keeping it up to, it's up to you. But it also kind of goes with the other bit that we just talked about, the social thing. Um, I have a lot of people ask me, okay, what's your real job? What do you really do? When is this going to end? Are you still dancing? When does that end? You know, when are you going to go to school? So it's kind of, <laughs> when are you getting a real job? So it, that's a bit difficult also, is people just don't really understand it a lot. Um, and you are kind of lonely a lot of the time. And then how do I deal with off days, having bad turning days and things? Everybody has off days, um, whether you're a dancer or not. But the biggest thing to me about being a dancer is that we have tomorrow to fix it. Um, I admire professional competing athletes, because we are athletes, professional competing athletes so much. Figure skaters, gymnasts, swimmers, all the, the athletes in the Olympics. Because they literally have... They work for four years and it all depends on like 30 seconds. If you're on, you're on. If you're off, you're not. And only one person wins and you have the best time or you don't or you get the highest scores. Um, I can't imagine working for four years and having everything depend on, you know, the gymnast with the vaulting. Literally like eight seconds and your, your life comes down to eight seconds. I cannot imagine that. So for us, it's very, very wonderful that tomorrow we can fix it. Oh, it'll be better the next performance. And there's constantly growth and change. And it's never about a time. It's never about being number one. Um, you know, there are different things about different dancers and you, you can work on your performances. They're going to get better. As I said, you peak when you're older. You don't have to be 17 to be at your peak. Um, so it's about constantly that we have, we have the next date. To, to get it better. Having said that, obviously you need to dance as if every day was your last, but we have the opportunity that it doesn't have to be perfect every single day. We're not up for medals. We're not up for awards. Um, so that's very, very helpful to me. And when I have a bad day, I just get through it and know it'll be better tomorrow. How do you deal with having a studio that isn't professional enough and not serious training? My parents don't want me to move away for another year, but I feel like I'm losing valuable and important time. And that kind of goes with the next question was, in the place that I live, the ballet level is not very high. There is ballet, but I wouldn't call it professional. My parents don't have enough money to send me to a professional school. What should I do? This is something I get asked a lot. Not enough classes, not enough training, um, which is one reason I, I sort of started this YouTube channel. When I was a student, people were so secretive about everything. They didn't want to help me. I mean, I couldn't even get help trying to sew my point shoes. So that's one of the reasons I started this, is so you all have someone to help you. You can learn if you don't have the money or you don't have the availability of things to you. I have all of the, the bar exercises, my, my feet and point work strengthening exercise workout. There is an exercise playlist I have created, so if you want to see everything in one place, um, the playlist is at the bottom of this screen. I'll also link it in the box below. But I think trying to do as much as you can. Um, maybe talk to your teacher. People are scared to talk to their teachers, but if you really present your case and say, I really am passionate about this, I want to get better, 
um, you know, things like that. They will, they will want to help you. They love students that want to work. So, you know, maybe talk to your teacher, talk to your parents about maybe if there's another studio in your area. I know when I was younger, for a couple of years, I took at two studios. I took classes at two different studios, which helped me tremendously. Um, but I would encourage you to do all of my workouts here and um, just just believe in yourself and just keep doing as much as you can because a lot of people are going what you're going through. A lot of people don't have enough classes. Um, so just, just keep working as hard as you can. It's a very difficult situation and it is kind of a personal thing. So maybe talk to someone, your teacher, your parents about it. Okay, next two questions also go together. I was wondering how you dealt with weight gain or body image in general. I often find it really hard not to compare myself to other dancers, especially when you stand in front of the mirror all day comparing yourself. Could you have, and then the other person asked, could you give some advice on losing weight as a ballet dancer the healthy way? I understand that in order to lose weight, you just lower the amount of calories you eat and increase the exercise. But I already dance a lot and I'm worried that if I eat less, I will have less energy and won't perform well. As I've told you all, I will be doing a diet video. It's coming in August, so I don't want to touch too much on this because then I won't have anything to say in the other video. But the biggest thing about, as far as losing weight goes, is please do it a healthy way. Um, if you have an eating disorder, if you're anorexic or bulimic, I'm not here to criticize you. I understand that it is a disease and it's not in your control. It's not just about starting to eat or, or not, you know, making yourself sick. Please, please get some help. Um, I know it doesn't happen overnight, but to those of you who don't have an eating disorder and want to lose weight, I personally think if you're under the age of 18, you shouldn't be dieting anyway because your body is still changing. Um, but just make sure it's healthy and balanced. I mean, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. If you do it overnight and starve it off, it will come back on. I've seen it time and time again. Um, and it, you'd feel horrible. And as a dancer, you need to be in shape. You can't be blacking out in the middle of class. You need to be able to finish class and feel strong and feel energized because that's how you're going to get better. I personally would rather keep my diet, diet healthy and do more exercise than not eat anything and just, you know. Um, now, as far as body image goes, again, if you're younger, your body is changing. It will not stay the same as it was. Um, but I, I think... One of the things I've been doing, you all know I've had the illness, I've said it a million times, but I gained a lot of weight. And when I, as I was coming back, when I was still really, really big, um, I didn't look at myself in the mirror at all. I stood at a bar spot that had no mirror. I just, if I was in the center, I just didn't look. Because when you're on stage, you're not looking in the mirror anyway. So it was actually kind of a good exercise for me to feel everything rather than depend on the mirror. Um, so just for a while until you're, if you're trying to lose weight or you're not happy with your body, just don't look. It's not gonna benefit to you to look. You're gonna make yourself miserable staring at yourself. So I just didn't look and it really, really helped me because now I see my body is getting back to where it was and I feel so much better about myself and I've kind of figured out how to feel things rather than depending on the mirror. Um, so really just try and, and not focus so much on it. Focus on what you're doing, focus on your technique um, because more often than not, you feel worse than you actually look. I think it's, it's, all, it's all a mental thing. What are professional ballet dancers most excited about hearing as feedback of their work after a performance or a rehearsal? And what do they like to hear from fans? That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much. Um, okay, after performances. For me, it was kind of... Um, it depended on the performance. If it was a three-act ballet, example, when I danced Aurora, when I danced Juliet, I didn't really want to hear any corrections afterwards because with Juliet I was emotionally spent, with Aurora I was physically spent and I, I loved hearing and, and people were good about that with me. They said great job, it was beautiful or whatever and then the following day, ordinarily when you have a big role like that you'll rehearse the following day to fix anything, you, any of the mistakes you made. So that's when I wanted to hear the feedback. Now for example if it was a smaller role, as in City Ballet they have 20 minute pieces quite a lot of the time. Um, I wouldn't mind hearing things right after the performance. Um, and usually with people, some people, they sort of just launched into them. With, with me, I always got something nice followed by something to work on, which really, really helped me. I never just want to hear how wonderful I am because I'll never improve. I, I don't actually like that. Hearing, oh, it was wonderful, it was beautiful, it was wonderful, it was beautiful. I love getting notes. I love getting corrections. Um, I remember one, it was my Sugar Plum debut, Sugar Plum Fairy in the Nutcracker. 
and and my partner and I we missed something or something wasn't quite right or, or something and Peter came back and said good but and we had to do it right then and there and we fixed it which ended up really helping because it was instant and we we he didn't forget to tell us we didn't we, we could feel it right away um, and so people were looking at him like why is he doing that but I actually found it very very beneficial because it was immediate fix it and the next performance it went absolutely fine so I love hearing corrections obviously everybody wants to hear they're beautiful and wonderful if, if you don't want to hear that then there's something seriously wrong with you but um, everybody loves getting compliments but I also love getting critiques. Now obviously I don't want to be yelled at, but I love hearing what I can work on because otherwise I wouldn't be improving and I might as well stop. Um, now from fans, um, the, uh, the people might think that I love hearing how wonderful I am from them, but that's not my favorite thing to hear from all of you. The things you all tell me that mean the most to me is how inspiring I am. My story, my fighting through this to get back, um, how much I've encouraged you and inspired you to dance even if you stopped dancing a long time ago or if you're going through something how encouraging I've been to you that means more to me than you possibly know rather than just telling me how wonderful I am how beautiful I am how whatever, whatever it is the fact that you all think I'm inspiring to you and that I've pushed you to do something um, and or encourage you to keep fighting for your dreams that means more to me than you know because I've had a lot of people especially right now and, and there is an interview tomorrow I'm going to post a video of it's actually a podcast and I take you through my entire career my illness everything so be watching for that tomorrow but that's what means the most to me is hearing from all of you how inspiring I am and have been to you so I really really appreciate and you all have been so complimentary of me and I I can't even believe it. I just did this to help people and to, to hopefully help your career, but in turn you've actually helped mine and me believe in myself, so thank you so much for that. Do you know any school that offers a program for people of other countries? What do you recommend for me to do? Um, if you are from a foreign country and are trying to go to an American school, or an American trying to go to a foreign school, um, same problem, same situation, I would say first of all make a video um, if you're trying to audition for a summer program, for the year-round program, and you can't fly over there, um, make a video of yourself doing a class, but also stick in a variation, a classic variation, or I would do one very classical variation, Sleepy Beauty, Swan Lake, Nutcracker, and then stick in something a little more contemporary. Um, maybe you can have someone choreograph something for you. Just show them a video showing your strengths and how much you can do, essentially. Um, as far as school goes, schools go, I know a lot of schools are inter uh, auditioning internationally now. SAB is, I believe ABT does um, a little thing with international students. So it's just about doing your research. But the biggest thing, if you are an international student or a dancer and you want to go to another country, regardless of where and when and where you're from, you need to assure them that you are able to move there or that you are able to relocate if they want you to. Because otherwise, if you say that you're not, they're not going to take you. That's what I've found with a lot of international people, especially even with, with Broadway. If you're a Broadway dancer and you, they say, can you be on tour and da da da, or can you move to New York and do this? If they say, well, I'm not sure, I don't know, that ends right there, right there. So make sure if you are able to relocate, if you are able to move and you are willing and can, tell them because they want to hear that because that means oh good they can great we'll take them as opposed to oh well they're unsure next so make sure if you're international going somewhere you tell them you can relocate I have big legs hips and flat feet so I barely stand a chance any words of wisdom first of all you don't know that you don't know that you don't have a chance um, I would recommend if you're on if you don't like your body if you think you have this or that do do a supplemental form of exercise. Pilates is great. Um, again, I've given you all the exercises here. I'm doing more. I'm doing a turnout one coming soon. Um, feet especially. Do some do some supplemental exercise. I think I've mentioned this to all of you before. I believe it was in the injuries video. Um, just so you can you can supplement your dancing. Again, don't rely on your ballet training to keep you in shape because it's not going to happen. Um, just relying on ballet is, is not the best idea. So I would do some supplemental exercise to sort of make your body stronger, to make it more to your liking. Um, watch your diet, obviously. But as far as you think, 
thinking you barely have a chance. I want to address that more than your body shape. If you don't believe you have a chance, you don't. This is for anybody, if you're doubting yourself. Um, if you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. Let me give you a huge, huge example. You all know, have the, have the illness, all of that, as I've mentioned. Tomorrow will be the big interview on that. I've been told so many times by so many people that I am a failure, a fool, and an idiot for trying to get back to the stage. Literally to my face. And I, at this point, laugh at them because they don't know that. Who are they to tell me that? You know what I mean? And there are people who don't really have a clue. Some people who have a clue, huge, huge teachers. I had a beautiful, wonderful, one of my SAB teachers come down and work with me recently. She said, oh, you're going to get there. No problem. She said, all you have to do now, she said, you're in shape. Lose the rest of your weight and you're there. So she has a clue and she's told me that I will get back there. People who don't have a clue have told me I'm, I'm a fool, literally to my face. So, but I, I, am li I, I don't listen to them. I declare that I'm going to be back there. I believe I'm going to be back there and all I have to do is do it. If I think I'm going to do something, it's going to happen. If you believe you can do something, it will. Because if you don't or if you doubt yourself or you say, I'm, that's never going to happen, it won't. You're the first, you're the only person that has to believe in yourself. And this is this is getting so um, me trying to be inspirational here, but you know, you read about the big successes in life. Walt Disney didn't finish high school. M M uh, Macy, who started Macy's, I think went bankrupt like six or seven times or something. So you, you don't, people laughed in, in their face. And so you, they, but they believed in them, themselves. So if you believe in yourself and you want something bad enough, it can happen. I don't care how crazy people think it is because there's so many success, success stories like that. Um, so I've had people literally laughing in my face, but I, I don't, I don't believe it. I've heard about comments on websites and it just doesn't matter to me at this point because I know what I need to do to get back there. I know I can and I believe that I can. So believe that you can and you will. What tips do you have for dancers who want to transition into full time? What age is to good is good to transition into full time? I'm assuming you mean full time dancing, full time being a student. Um, I would say that if you want to be a professional dancer, that you should around the age of 15 and 16 you should be dancing at least five or six days a week. You should be doing a lot of classes, um, getting someone to help you. Um, because companies like hiring 17, 18, 19, and you will be thrown into a full schedule. So I would, you know, again, I've given you all the, the videos. Make sure you're doing not just one class a day. If, if you want to be a professional dancer and you're 15 or 16, do my bars and then go to class. Or do my bars at some point. And do, you need to be doing a lot um, rather than two or three classes a week. I've touched on this before. But I think 15, 16 is a good age to really be focusing on your, your career. What ballet schools are the best ones for improving quickly? Uh, this, it's not really the school that will make you improve quickly. You can improve anywhere. This is kind of going back to the believing in yourself thing. If you want to improve and you are work, willing to work to improve, you can. Um, so the, the thing with the ballet school is you need to be getting enough classes. This I've mentioned this previously. We were talking about it before. Make sure you're getting five to six days a week, at least five or six classes a week. Um, Again, you can do everything I've given you here. That's why I've done this for all of you. Again, everybody was so secretive when I was a student. Nobody wanted to help me. I couldn't get any, any advice anywhere. So that's, that's why I'm here is for all of you. So as far as your ballet school goes, make sure you have good teachers. Make sure you have enough classes. But improving quickly is entirely up to you. I'm an intermediate advanced level in my ballet training and I love my ballet school but there isn't a ton of options for classes. Same thing, I would like more. I just built an amazing dance studio in my basement with a Marley floor, mirrors, and a bar. I feel like practicing by myself but it won't do much good if I do that. Kind of going along with previous questions. Um, Again, just do as much as you can. Maybe get a teacher to help you. I, my parents built a little studio for me in our house a long time ago. I still have it, still use it every day. Marley, bars, a mirror. Um, again, just doing as much as you can. Talk to your teacher. They will be willing to help you. Um, I've sort of touched on this before, but I think the more you want it and the more you work, you can get there no matter what your circumstance. What do you do about point shoes that really die fast? How do you preserve them? Fantastic question. 
Um, in the point shoe tips and tricks video, I mentioned to all of you that I glue my shoes. Many, most professionals do that. And basically it's called jet glue, where I glue the inside and glue the, the around the outside. And basically it just gets more wear out of them. It rehardens the glue. Because if you didn't know, point shoes are essentially paper mache, which is kind of insane if you think about it, we're dancing with paper mache shoes. But what happens when you sweat is that the glue breaks down and they get very, very soft. So you re-glue them to re-harden them and then they last. So I would recommend gluing your shoes. If you're already gluing your shoes and they're still dying fast, I would maybe look into a different shoe. Might be the shoe and not you. How do you ever learn the steps to some of those balancing ballets with music by Stravinsky, such as Agon? The music seems so difficult to dance to. It is, but I will say, with especially with New York City Ballet, as I've mentioned before, you have to have been trained at SAB to get in the company. Um, and while you're at SAB, they teach us a lot of those ballets very early on. Um, for example, in one of my variations classes, my first year, we didn't do solos. We learned the core, which if you don't know ballet terminology, the, the core are the, the background dancers, either the 8 or 10 or 16, however many girls or boys that aren't the soloists. Um, we learned core roles. And so we would do the core of Contrary Barocco. I think we also learned four, t four temperaments. So we learned very, very early on at SAB how to hear that music, how to count it, what the steps are. Um, and then once you get into the company as an apprentice, you understudy everything. Meaning you learn all the ballets, but you never dance them. That's what an understudy means. And you could go on if you needed to. But so you're constantly in those rehearsals, you're constantly learning the steps. And then by the time you actually dance the roles or get a principal role in one of those ballets, it's in you. So it's kind of one of those things that is just sort of ingrained very, very early. We're all used to it. We're all accustomed to it. Everybody knows the steps to every ballet um, just by being around it, pretty much. Final question. Next year I'm moving away from home to go to a dance school. The school is across the country in Vancouver, about a five hour plane ride. I was wondering if you could give me some tips and advice on living away from home. Congratulations, fantastic. Um, I would say the biggest thing about living away from home, I think I mentioned this in the summer course video, is just to really take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, focus on what you need to do, focus on why you're there, focus on your technique, um, really make the most of your opportunity. But as far as living away from home is concerned, make sure you have a support system. Call your parents, have a friend, um, someone that is, is fully supportive of you, kind of going back to the friends thing, and uh, that you can talk to about it. And I've said this before, if you don't have anybody in your life that you can talk to about something, I am here for all of you. That's again why I started this. Um, I just recently, on my fan page on Facebook, not on my personal page, I have two pages, um, but on my fan page, to this morning, I found my messages on my fan page. I didn't know they existed. I didn't know they were there. So if, if you wrote to me on that page, the page where you like rather than subscribe, um, I haven't gotten to you because I just now found the messages. So I do apologize if I haven't responded to you. But you can always message me. You can write me here in a comment. Or you can say something on Instagram. Uh, on Twitter, I have, I am here for all of you. I can't promise again that I'll reply right away because I'm getting a lot of comments, but I am here to talk to you. If you are having a serious problem, I will help you through it. I absolutely promise you all that. So I hope this helped all of you. Again, um, just me answering your questions. I will be doing this monthly. There is something I wanted to say about the learning the combinations quickly video that I just posted that I, that I didn't really mention. We, some of you got confused when I meant don't dance while the teacher was was giving the combination. Um, I told you not to mark. What I mean by not marking is not doing it in the mirror and totally not looking at them. You can mark with your hands, do the arms, do the feet, but make sure you are watching the teacher um, because otherwise you'll miss something. I just mean, I've seen so many students when the teacher's giving the combination, just doing it in the mirror and not looking at them. Because if you need to learn by doing, keep doing it. But you can mark with your hands or your arms but make sure you're focused on the teacher. So I wanted to say that. So be looking for my big podcast interview tomorrow. I love you all, and I will see you then.